All right, now we're gonna take a look at viruses, viroids, and purons. So guys, a virus, recall from the beginning of the semester, is that they are acellular, they do not have a cell. So this can mean that they are considered non-living particles. You have to have at least one cell to be considered a living thing. They are also obligate intracellular parasites. They have to get inside of a cell in order to hijack its machinery to make more of the viruses. So there's some basic viral structure that we want to look at. All viruses have an inner nucleic acid core. Now this, this nucleic acid core could either be DNA or RNA. It could be a single strand or it could be a double strand. Okay, so they can have a lot of different types. They can have a double-stranded DNA, they can have a single-stranded DNA. They could have a double-stranded RNA or they could have a single-stranded RNA. All right, so it gives lots of variety there. They also will have an outer protein capsid that surrounds that nucleic acid core. And this may have different shapes depending on what kind of virus we're looking at. Now, some of them will also have an envelope. So just like how an envelope helps protect your letter and hides what the, what's in the letter, the envelope can do the same thing for the virus. So let's do a comparison of bacteria and viruses, okay? Because a lot of times they get thrown into the same boat, but they're not the same. So for cellular organization, bacteria actually has that. Whereas viruses don't, they don't have cells. Metabolic activity, bacteria has. Viruses do not. Bacteria can respond. Viruses cannot. So again, this is again showing you that viruses are not living things. Now replicates. Yes, bacteria replicates through binary vision, but so can viruses. But viruses can only do this if they get inside of a host cell. When we look at mutates, does it mutate and change? Bacteria does. So do viruses. This is why it makes it difficult for us to potentially develop vaccines against some viruses. A plasma membrane, bacteria have it, virus do not. Organelles, bacteria has them, but just or ribosomes. Remember, they do not have the membrane bound organelles. Viruses do not. RNA and DNA, yes, bacteria have both. Viruses don't, they have an either or. They either have DNA or they have RNA. They don't have both. Now, filterable, size dependent. Viruses are super small, so they're anywhere between 200 and 1,000 nanometers in size. So we're talking about the filterable part here with being size dependent. We're talking about can it pass through a bacteriological filter? Bacteria can't, that's the point. It's supposed to capture the bacteria, but viruses can. They come through with the filtrate. They come through with the liquid that has been filtered because they are so small. We do see that bacteria is sensitive to antibiotics. Viruses are not. We do not need to use antibiotics to treat viruses. We could use things like interferons, which is a different chemical that we'll talk about later when we talk about the immune system. Now what's the general morphology when we look at viruses? Viruses can have lots of different shapes to them. So over here, I have a list of different shaped viruses and then I have some pictures. So we have a helical virus, a polyhedral virus, an envelope virus, and a complex virus. Okay, so which one of these pictures, A through D, represents the helical virus? Well, a helical virus is represented by C, and this would be what you'd kind of see with like tobacco mosaic virus, a virus that attacks tobacco plants. What about the polyhedral virus? Polyhedral means it has multiple sides. This is like an adenovirus, a nanovirus is like the common cold, and the poliovirus. This would be seen in enveloped viruses, could be where they have an envelope and they're helical in their structure. This would be like what you would see with influenza virus here in D. We also see that there could be an enveloped polyhedral virus where it has lots of sides that's inside an envelope, and that's what you see here with B. Okay, so those are those structures. When we look at a complex virus like a pox virus or a bacteriophage, these are gonna have other structures that are part of it. Okay, and if you look at the bacteriophage especially, to me it kind of reminds me of the little guy that's in Sid's room in Toy Story 1 that comes out with the head and all the little legs. That's kind of like what the bacteriophage looks like here. All right, but it's just showing you that they can be even more advanced in their structures, but regardless, they still have DNA or RNA, and they have some sort of 
capsid present. Now let's look at the taxonomy of viruses. Well, when we look at the taxonomy of viruses, viruses get grouped by the type of nucleic acid. Do they have DNA or do they have RNA? Then they look at their morphology. What kind of shape do they have? Is there an envelope? Yes or no? And also, what's their host range? What kind of host are they going to infect? What's their niche? Okay, what do they prefer infecting? Because some, some viruses only infect bacteria. Others only infect plants. Others only infect certain animals. So we need to look at their host range. Now, when we look at this, guys, their general name or suffix is going to have the virus. So we see that norovirus is going to denote an actual virus genre, okay? It's going to have a certain group to it. They also may have a family name suffix like virididae, and so that's going to denote their viral family, okay? So when we have it here where we have the calciver viridae, that's going to be their family that they're part of. Now, how are we going to cultivate viruses, specifically like bacteriophages? Because it's going to be difficult, they can't just grow on anything because they need cells. Well, one way we can do this is through what we call the plaque method. All right, we are going to give those bacteriophages some bacteria to infect and grow in. And so what we do is we take our normal nutrient auger that we would use to grow bacteria, and we do a bacterial spread plate. When we do a spread plate, guys, we're going to take the bacteria we want to get, and we're going to spread it all around and cover the plate completely with bacteria. Then we're going to add a thin layer of liquefied auger. All right, so they're going to liquefy the auger and they're going to add the virus to that auger. Okay, they're going to pour that auger over the top of our field of bacteria. All right, then we're going to incubate it. When we incubate it, if we start to see clearings like spaces inside of the plate that don't have any bacteria growing, that tells us that the bacteriophage or the virus got into those bacteria and it caused those bacteria to make more viruses. These are known as clearings and these are plaque forming units and we would be able to count these to see how well that bacteriophage was working, how effective it was against that bacteria. Another way we can cultivate viruses is through animal cultivation. This means we have to cultivate them in living animals. Okay, so we can end up using living animals like you see there with uh, the rat. Another way could be through em um, embryonic eggs. Okay, so we can put them into eggs and we can also see how they develop because there's still live cells in there. Or we could potentially use cell cultures that we call the cryptopathic effect or we could look for CPE. CPE is referring to cell degeneration. So then how do we ID if a virus has been present like from your blood when we talk about serological IDs, very specifically when we're looking for a specific virus that was in your blood? Well, we can look for the virus antigen plus antibodies. When we do that, we are then going to see a reaction that's present. In the lab, that reaction then can be noted. One of the main ways that we do this is through what we call the Western blot method. Now let's look at viral multiplication. How does that virus make more of itself? Okay, it's going to first have to invade the host cell. Once it invades the host cell, it commandeers the host's metabolic activities. This means it takes it over. It tells the cell now, hey, you're not going to do any more of your normal job. You're going to start making more of me. Okay, the virus is going to be what all that cell does. A single viron is capable of producing thousands of new viruses that could be released. Now, one of the main ways that the virus is going to do this multiplication is through what we call the lytic cycle. When we look at the lytic cycle, we see the first step is attachment. The virus has to actually attach to the cell. Once it attaches to the host cell, it will then move to number two where it's penetration. Penetration is where the virus is going to inject its DNA or RNA into the host cell. Then the third step occurs, biosynthesis. This is when the phage DNA from the virus is going to start making new parts of the virus. So it's going to start making all of the components, more copies of the DNA or RNA. It's going to make the capsids, all of the components needed to assemble a virus. Maturation is when those viral parts are going to be assembled. They're going to be put together. And then the last step is release. The cell will burst, releasing all the new viruses made, and each of those viruses can now go infect another cell. Okay, this is known as the lytic cycle.
Not all viruses use the lytic cycle. Some of them also use what we call the lysogenic cycle. Now the lysogenic cycle, if you'll notice, is very similar to the lytic cycle. When you look over here on the side, it's very similar, but we do see that it's gonna be different with one step. All right, so attachment still occurs. We see that the virus has to attach and it has to do penetration and add its copy of DNA or RNA into the cell. But something can happen here between steps two and three. A new step that comes in is called integration. This is where the piece of DNA from the virus actually integrates into the DNA of the host cell. It can then sit in there and it can go through the process of just being there without actually causing the, it to make any more viruses for a long period of time. So that one bacteria got infected, it didn't make new viruses, but then that bacteria or cell divided. Now I have two, and they both have a copy of the virus. And then these two can divide and then I have four, then I have eight, then I have 16. And the more that division happens, the more are infected with this strand of a virus with its DNA. When a stressor comes into play, it can cause that DNA to be activated and then it continues with the rest of the lytic cycle. It causes it to the cell to then undergo biosynthesis, maturation, and then release. And so unlike the, lyso, uh, the lytic cycle, one cell released hundreds of new viruses. In the lysogenic cycle, 16 cells could release 100 new viruses. So you see how this one could be a little more dangerous and it also lays dormant and you don't realize you have the virus. Okay, and so we have these two ways of multiplication. We have the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. All right, so this is what we can see here with that whole idea of the lysogenic. You can see that it attached, it injected its DNA, but the DNA was integrated. So one cell went to two, those two cells went to four, and when it was triggered to actually release the virus and go into the lytic cycle, lots more viruses are then released at once. Now, in your notes, you can click on these little videos on YouTube and they will cover again the lytic and the lysogenic cycle. So if we're looking here, there are some special viruses that have to undergo even a, another step when we talk about this lytic cycle. So replication or multiplication of a retrovirus has to take an extra step. You'll notice that they have their attachment, they have their penetration, but what they are actually injecting is RNA. Well, RNA doesn't allow the cell to go through its normal process of transcription and translation. So we have to copy the RNA back into DNA. And these viruses actually package their own enzyme called reverse transcriptase to do this. They then can take that DNA and integrate it into the DNA of the host cell. And then when it is triggered, it can then continue to do biosynthesis, maturation, and release. All right, so a little extra step there is where they have to go from RNA to DNA if they're what we call a retrovirus. And guys, HIV is an example of a retrovirus. And again, here is a link that you can use to watch a video about retrovirus replication. All right, so if we look here, this chart's just summarizing how that works. You have attachment, you have entry, which is the injection, there's an encoding that occurs. It can then also go into an integration phase where it stays dormant, or it can go to biosynthesis and release. This also gives you a comparison between a bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria, versus a virus that infects animals. All right, this leads us to viruses and cancer. When we're talking about viruses and cancer, we've got to look at what we call transduction. Transduction is the transfer of, a DNA, of DNA from one cell to another, and this is done by bacteriophages. This may result in cellular transformations. This can actually convert a gene that we already have, we all have these called proto-oncogenes, into actual oncogenes. And oncogenes are the cancer genes. These could also mutate our tumor suppressor cells, both of which can cause the development of cancer to occur. So the normal cell has been mutated and now it is abnormal. Some DNA oncogene viruses that can actually cause this mutation to occur are things like HPV, um, Epstein-Barr or EB, and hepatitis B. 
RNA oncogenic viruses that can also cause um, cancers are T cell leukemia and certain lymphomas. All right, so how do these viruses make us sick? Okay, you get exposed to the virus. The virus is gonna come into your body and there's gonna be an incubation period. For some viruses, that incubation period is very short. Others, it might be very long. Most viruses fall into the category of an acute effect infection. So within a couple of days, the viral load, the number of virons goes up so high that it causes you to have your symptoms and you get sick. Eventually though, that caps out, okay, it maxes out, and then you return back down to normal. This is what we see with majority of viruses. However, some viruses cause what we call persistent infections. So the incubation period is a lot longer, okay, but we do see that it can be persistent where it becomes the viral load gets bigger and bigger and then it starts to increase greatly. This is things like HPV, HIV with like AIDS, that's why the viral load gets bigger and it goes from HIV to AIDS, and then also HBV. On the other hand, some of these fall into what we call latent infections. These are things that like to stay dormant and then they start to come out when the opportunity comes up, especially if you're stressed or your immune system has been compromised. These include things like cold sores, which are herpes simplex 1, genital herpes, which is herpes simplex 2, or shingles, which which is also a herpes virus. And a lot of times you'll notice that these will have outbreaks more often when individuals are either stressed or immunocompromised, sick with something else. Okay, so no, most viruses are gonna undergo the acute infection. Some of them are more persistent and others are latent where they come and go. All right, so a couple of other terms we need to look at. A viron, guys, is found in animals, plants, and bacteria, and this is a complete virus. When we talk about a viron being a complete virus, this means it contains the protein capsid and the nucleic acid core, those two main components. A viroid can be found in infecting plants. Viroids that infect plants are infectious RNA particles, so they don't actually have the capsid, they're just infectious RNA particles. Now, even scarier are pyrons. Pyrons can infect animals, and these are going to be what we call proteinaceous infectious particles. These proteinaceous infectious particles are proteins that have been mutated. Okay, these proteins that have been mutated then cause other proteins to mutate. It's like they peer pressure them to mutate as well. This is what we call scrappy in sheep or mad cow disease in cows. However, it can also cause Kruar or Krufelt Jacobs disease or, CD, CD, or CJD in humans. Viral diseases and their agents are gonna be something that you're gonna start studying now, okay? There is, in your modules, you're gonna find that there are some study sheets for you. Study sheets one through three are gonna focus mostly on bacteria, but study sheet four are going to be for the viruses and their diseases. You are going to be held accountable for all of those viruses on your final exam, okay? And there are, there are plenty of opportunities for you to study, and I even have a practice quiz for you to quiz yourself. And you can take that practice quiz as many times as you want in unit or module three.